Welcome everybody for another new episode of Future Bytes. We are on uh, stage uh, 17 at the Cumulus Studios in Penn Plaza on the Hackensack Meridian Health uh, Sponsor Stage. Today is uh, uh, <laughs> an episode that I'm really fond of because it reminds me of when I was young and for the first time I experimented with uh, indoor farming. Uh, I grew up, uh, well, first of all, welcome to my guests. I have uh, Rob Lang from uh, Farm One. I have uh, Yara Nagi, Director of Operations for Agritecture, and uh, Marco Shima, co-founder of uh, AeroFarms. So we're going to be talking about vegetables, a new way of, of, of uh, growing your leaves. I grew up in a farm in Italy. Uh, it was more of, a, of an olive orchard, so it wasn't really kind of like driven by you know, the production of kale or carrots. Uh, it was a hunting ground for the farmers that tended the, the vineyards and the olive trees, uh, and just a great place for me and my brother to just run over with bicycles. Then, eventually, at some point in high school, I discovered uh, cannabis. And uh, I decided that it was not proper to try to grow it outside, because my parents would have killed me. So I did my first experiments inside. Not thinking that my mother would enter the room and say, what is this? But you know, they, they were cool with it. It was a uh, trial and error. It was 20 years ago. There was really no research. No, it was really like try to figure it out and do it. And just the idea of saying I'm growing weed in my, my house, it just was good enough for me, at least. Didn't go anywhere. I wasn't good. Too, too many issues. And that is uh, what we are here to talk about. Um, the world is changing. Resources are limited. Population is growing. Uh, the weather is changing, so places uh, on this planet that used to be fertile or, or where you could availably and, and readily grow uh, are, are changing, it's becoming increasingly difficult. And then we find ourselves in a city like New York City. In a city like New York City where space is not abundant for, it's impossible, getting fresh ingredients is extremely expensive. So that's when people like you decide to start a little revolution and get going with uh, a new idea of culturing, a new way of, uh, of growing ingredients and making them uh, available for the public or for the industry. Uh, Yara, I would like to start with you. What is, uh, what is it that you do? What is that your company do? And how, how did it start? Um, so I work for Agritecture. Mm -hmm. And it's a technology agnostic firm based in New York City that basically helps people who want to start their own urban farming projects. Okay. And we actually, interestingly enough, started out as a blog mm -hmm. and just started getting a lot of demand from people there. And we would just publish kind of information, trying to make it accessible, information about CEA or vertical farming. And then people started reaching out to us and they were like, well, I want to do this too. Can you help me out? And so that's kind of how this firm was born, um, from that kind of interest. I, I find it, I mean, look, you know, I, I lived a few years in Los Angeles, so I had sun, I had, you know, south-facing windows, and growing herbs for my kitchen was easy. In a place like New York, it really doesn't matter where you live, it's like you got shadows all around you. It's really hard to look for the sun. So growing herbs uh, in your kitchen, to me, is something that is extremely romantic, but also useful. Right. But there are a lot of logistic issues, right? You go, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm Rob. Oh, sorry, um, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Farm One. And we're a small vertical farming company. Uh, and both of our farms are actually in Manhattan. Okay. So vertical farming means we're using hydroponics in stacked growing layers mm -hmm. and LED lights. Okay. Uh, and we're growing completely indoors. So it's not a greenhouse. It's absolutely actually in a basement. And we tend to grow things that are very, very special. So uh, rare herbs, edible flowers, and microgreens uh, for chefs in the city. It's normally products that you would really struggle to get in New York, mm -hmm. especially in the winter months. Absolutely. Uh, products that normally people are shipping in from Mexico or California over long distances. And so instead, with this new tech, we're able to actually grow these interesting, cool things right in the middle of the city. So for the moment, you're uh, more of a chef-driven product. Uh, do you expect to scale up and eventually be able to reach the, the public? Is a Well, we have a very high-end product. Okay. Um, and so most of the time, it's chefs at really good restaurants who are really Requirement. excited about that product. I think over time, we may look into premium grocery and, and other areas. But right now, we're very focused on that high-end restaurant market. And, uh, and then Mark for AeroFarm. So what about you? What about your company? Yeah, just a little bit of history about AeroFarms. Uh, we've been at this since 2004. We actually started out in the Finger Lakes area, upstate mm -hmm. New York. 
and that's all science driven, right? The idea of growing indoors without sun or soil and similar to what Rob was saying that we grow with vertical stacks of bed. Instead of hydroponics, we're using aeroponics. That's the aero and aero farm. So we're misting the roots, very targeted, very judicious, using 95% less water. It's a way of growing that uses no pesticides. So it's a clean product that's ready to eat product. And it's really thinking very differently about our inputs. You know, you talked about some of the macro challenges. Without question, in terms of uh, increasing you know, population, urbanization, mother nature, those challenges are more acute than ever before. We have to think about new paradigms, new ways of growing. And that's what we're excited about what we're doing at, at AeroFarms. How do we enable local production, but at scale? And so we sell to a wide range of different customers mm -hmm. from not only the top chefs, but really the mass supermarkets. And okay. It's really about how do we feed the masses? How do we democratize access to good food? Our global headquarters is in nearby Newark, New Jersey. Okay. And we've had a, a working farm at different sizes. So it's the world's largest indoor vertical farm. We also have an installation in an inner city school there for over eight years that's right in their dining hall. It's operated by the students, creating amazing connections with food. And I was really struck when you talk about, in your opening remarks, about culture. You know, food is so important in terms of how you bring the community together, how you nourish it. And that's what we're really excited about, what we're doing at AeroFarms, how we can have that impact in multiple well, ways. You know, it, it's interesting because I remember when I was living in Los Angeles, the, there was one of those uh, stores, the Sharper Image Store, where you find those weird appliances that kind of like they're very futuristic, not necessarily they have a use to it, but you like just to spend the money and have it in the house so you can kind of like show it to your friends. And they did have... Uh, one of the first eight pot hydroponics uh, with an LED lights that came up and down and you could do basil or fennel or little plants and move the light. Obviously, I didn't plant those seeds. I planted other seeds. It didn't work again. <laughs> uh, we will talk about the issues of, uh, you know, raising indoor and, and what are the issues of raising indoor. But my point, especially at this time and age, uh, and uh, I'll toss it to you, Yara, is that we spend so much time connected to our devices. Uh, there is uh, so many things in our house that require, that, that we devote attention to, including a TV, that having a cabinet that is devoted to grow herbs, uh, we're finally getting to the point where it's not as complicated if you have the right mentors or, you know, th the information out there is accessible now to finally do something like that. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, a lot of people I think who started in this industry learned a lot of the information online. And that was something that kind of made it like revolutionary in a small way. You know, the small community that grew and grew and grew. But I think it's important to understand that, you know, it still is kind of fresh and there are still a lot of challenges Absolutely. that can be faced with this kind of stuff. And I know a lot of people who come up to us, they have these visions of really big farms or really big models. But, you know, I always go back to telling people like, in the end of the day, you're not selling a gadget. Right. You're selling a perishable good, yeah. right? The technology, in a way, is really something that goes hand in hand with growing the plant. Yes. But a lot of times, I feel that people really focus on that, and in reality, it kind of should be this sort of harmony of sorts. Th th so. That is true, but at the same time, if you think about the the kind of consumption, like I give, this is something that we were talking in one of the previous episodes, the. Uh, the ready-to-eat phenomenon, the fact that you can go to a grocery store and get a box of pre-washed, pre-cleaned, completely separated salad, that in two days uh, it starts dying in your fridge because it's not connected to its roots. It's, it, hasn't been, it hasn't been harvested or grown the, the proper way. Between the, that kind of loss or investing some time into doing it at, at home, uh, between the two, I am happy to see that this phenomenon is something that is uh, being it's coming out of people's intentions. It's yeah, because it of the is. demand. It's not because of there is a company above that is trying to push a product. It so is, people yeah. are really feeling the necessity. The consumers for are it. changing for so that. So that is, yeah. uh, that is, is it something that, that you guys see, you know, be between your clients? Uh, is there any of the restaurants that you serve to uh, asking you to build it at the restaurants, for an example? Um, definitely there's some interest there with having some production on site. Um, it's tricky to do that because, you know, restaurants go through... They're going to call you every half hour. It's like, oh my gosh, yeah. what do I do now? Yeah, or they, you know, restaurants just go through such a large quantity of produce that it, it's hard for them to really get a reliable, uh, you know, supply from something growing in-house. So, but definitely I think that the, 
the feeling is there and people that's why there's this excitement about farms actually growing right in the city or right next to the city yeah because what you were describing in terms of that salad bag it's it's all about freshness really yeah. that salad bag that you traditionally pick up in the supermarket it's often several days old by oh, the time absolutely. you get it and also it's maybe not handled in the best way and, and the so footprint and then the, the, the you know yeah, the, you have exactly. the harvest to the wash yeah. the plastic container the shipping right. like you know the, the the cost and the way that it adds up exactly and so, you know, I, and I think this sort of enters into Mark's world, really. But, you know, that traditional model for generating salad for mass consumption is kind of broken. And, and people, people are sensing that. And so it's exciting that we can now produce it in very clean facilities close to the city. I, I find it interesting because in the past few years, especially when I was doing the TV show, I noticed uh, that there has been an increase of restaurants opening within the farm. So as opposed to, you know, finding the right purveyor of ingredients or the right source, uh, people decided just to, you know, get out of the ha the get out of the city or just get as close as possible to the source or to the ingredients. But I've always, I, I've also visited places where I was pointed out that this is a restaurant, we cannot grow everything, the, the, the turnover is too much. So you also see that, you know, you say, oh, you, you, would, you know, this, these are the things that we're going to eat today for lunch. I was like, no, these are really the finishing herbs, uh, you know, we, we cannot grow as much. Uh, do you see, Rob, that the, um, uh, Mark, sorry, do you, do you see that these, uh, the work that you do is actually helping change that? Yeah, I mean, I think all these efforts we speak to, it's not just a fad, it's a trend, and it's really about this connection with food. And so we're excited that there's a lot of different solutions, you know, coming to the table, thinking about how do we enable that? And so some of it are some smaller installations. Uh, but the idea is, you know, how do you increase access? That's fundamentally one of, one of the key things here. And I think, you know, when we th first thought about what Aeroforms is trying to do, it was about how do we disrupt a very complex supply chain. So the kind of category that we grow commercially, leafy greens, herbs, most of that's coming from California or Arizona, depending on time of year. So a lot of different touch points in terms of getting that product. It is five to seven days old by the time it gets here. Uh, it's very complex in terms of refrigeration, the washing, very intensive. It's bruising the product. It's introducing moisture. That's one of the reasons right. why it's breaking down so fast. But that farmer, that field farmer, is focused on different attributes. Is it mildew resistant? Uh, can it be hardened to withstand this right, complex right, supply right. chain? Uh, you look at things like the seed bank, and 100 years ago, there were over 497 different types of lettuces, and of that today, there's only 46. Incredible. So we've lost this incredible rich biodiversity, the regional, local stuff. And so what we're really excited about as well is we can really bring excitement back into the category, focus on flavor first and foremost, have that be at the forefront, and really think about, again, creating some excitement in the category that can be you know, really accessible from all, all, all different parties. I, I think that, you know, again, it always goes back to the fact that we need uh, the consumer to be a little bit more connected to the ingredient that, you know, that they have. Is there, uh, a, a, along with the work uh, that, that you guys do, and this is actually a question for everybody, do you also produce content to be able to bring people to you? Do people seek out to you asking uh, information? Because this is a very non-traditional way of growing. There is a lot of knowledge that is involved. It's probably something that even to somebody like me that I come from the heart of Tuscany, to a degree it needs to be explained. Uh, where do you see the... Well, too many questions. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> These are all the questions that, uh, that I have in my head. Uh, let's start with the, with the, the most important, uh, to me at least, uh, logistically. For people that are really interested, what is the, the, the first step to get closer to uh, you know, growing greens uh, indoor and in your own house? And uh, can they reach out to you know, sources like you to, to know more about it? Yeah, I think I'm probably well placed to answer this. You know, at Farm One, we do a couple of things. We do tours of the farm and classes. And so, because we're right there in Manhattan, you can come and see one of these facilities. You can see vertical farming. You can taste the ingredients. And that's been really great to communicate what we're doing. Um, I've also written a book, uh, which is called Ditch the Dirt. And that's Hi. about growing hydroponically at home, introducing some of these methods and practices. And you know, as, as we've been saying, there are actually units you can buy now. You can do things DIY uh, yourself pretty easily. Um, so it's actually quite an accessible way of growing that I think, in my experience, has been a bit more predictable than growing stuff outdoors. And yes. So for the hobbyist, for people who are interested in growing some basil at home or something, there's some really nice uh, ways of doing that now. Oh, that actually gives me a, a good idea. So basil is something that you use all year round. I cook pasta, so <laughs> like I need to have basil. It doesn't matter if it's January, if there's three feet of snow. But one of the things that I noticed, uh, especially on the West Coast, when I discovered my first 24-7 uh, kind of supermarket, is that this uh, 
we are the expectation that the public has to have everything available all year round. One of the things that I didn't grow up with, I it kind of like to give an example, the poetry of uh, the first cherries or the first strawberries, mm -hmm. California killed it for me because all of a sudden those ingredients were available. So uh, do you work uh, seasonally? Do you try to stick with the seasonality or you actually try to use the technology that you have to be able to have a wide offering throughout the year? Yeah, at Aero Farms, uh, we're kind of celebrating both aspects in terms of really being able to bring innovation and new varieties to market quickly and getting people to try it. But at the end of the day, this is about how we enable that local production to be able to grow all year round and mm -hmm. have up to 30 harvests a year versus out in the field you may have two or three. And so what we found, particularly with the category of leafy greens that, and how people have integrated into lifestyle, like you were saying, it's January, you need that basil for your pasta. People are looking at this as a not only as a salad, but how they enjoy the leafy greens in other ways that this is now becoming something that they've integrated, and so it's a, it's a lifestyle approach as well. So we're all about offering both. Okay. Chiara, uh, the city. So the, the city, the, the, the urban structure of New York is something that stuns me. You know, uh, I li grew up in the country and I had nobody around. Then I moved to LA and everything was flat, everything was dispersed. Here everything grows vertically, which kind of like makes sense to the work that you do. Uh, where do you see in, in the urban environment the best solutions, like who can benefit the most uh, from, from this technology? People that have rooftops, people that have uh, a garage, people that have a basement, all of the yeah. above. What is the easiest way? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. Um, Thank you. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always kind of imagined this as well. And I think that with controlled environment agriculture and urban farming in cities, um, definitely the rooftops, definitely different warehouses, definitely in people's homes, like you were mentioning earlier, those kinds of systems. And I think all of that, um, greenhouses or indoors, kind of goes, will probably go in harmony with traditional agriculture too. You know, it's kind of going to be, um, you know, how I see kind of like this city in the future is you're going to have more kind of greenery and green spaces. Absolutely. And people crave that kind of yeah. stuff, especially in cities. Um but you know, kind of like Mark was mentioning earlier, um, and like you were mentioning, the different kind of produce that can be grown. There's some stuff that's more efficient, some stuff that's not, and some things that are more efficient in traditional agriculture. And I see those things kind of going hand in hand. But I do see cities kind of becoming greener and you know being able to see that visually from day to day. I, I, you know, I, or I take the F train from from Brooklyn to yeah. the city, so we do the bridge above you know for for uh, Fourth Avenue and. Whenever in New York you have the opportunity to be above other rooftops, you do see the amount of real estate that yeah. is available, either for harvesting solar power or for, I mean, the, my wife always uh, shows me books of buildings in New York City that used to have gardens and cows on the rooftops. Mm -hmm. There were farms in New York, you know, a century ago. Yeah. I haven't yeah. seen the cows. But oh, no, you haven't <laughs> seen it? I need to send you the picture. Yeah, no, it's every time that I talk about this project, then it's like, have you seen the picture? It's like, yes, you tell me all the time. <laughs> but, uh, I, but I think there's also, you know, if you think about the amount of unused space in New York as well, inside buildings, yeah. it's kind of incredible. You know, you've got thousands of buildings, you've got thousands of basements, you've got yeah. thousands of these weird sort of small places. They're probably not suitable for large-scale commercial farming, but they are suitable for people to grow things again, you know, for their, for their communities. Mm -hmm. And I think the really exciting thing that's happening is you know LED lighting which is the tech that we all use is going down in price in a similar okay. way that solar has been you know so the technology that we use now and pay ten thousand dollars for this year in ten years time it may cost more like one thousand dollars yeah which completely democratizes this whole thing mm. and also because of the controlled environment we can grow stuff that's not just this narrow range of produce that as we were saying used to be on the supermarket shelves we can grow things that actually relate to the diverse communities that make up the city. Well, to, so to a degree, yeah. Yara, this can be also a way of uh, <laughs> globalizing your produce in, in a, in a, in a microenvironment. Yeah, because all true. of a sudden, you, do, you can recreate whatever climate you want. So if you wanted to uh, grow an Asian herb or something that grows in a different kind of climate, is that something that is... Uh, done or we are still stuck to our kind of like, I mean, look, I, I don't, I think about growing basil and salad. Yeah. This is the first time that I'm like, that is true. It's like, you know, that is a close environment. I could do, you know, peppers from all over the world if I wanted to. Do you see that happening? Oh yeah, 100%. I mean, Aerofarms does it, Farm One does it. Um, you know, it's like according to the market. And I think also in accordance to like, 
you know, maybe like culturally appropriate foods. Um, we do work with a greenhouse here in New York City called Sky Vegetables. And it's a real it's really unique in the sense that it's on the roof of an affordable housing unit, so mm -hmm. in a pretty low income area. And you know, the first step that we always you know, that we took when we got involved, and I think a lot of farms do, is understanding that market, understanding your community, how to increase that what, accessibility, what do they kick, right? Uh, you know, what are they cooking downstairs? Exactly. What are they cooking really? downstairs? You know, what do they need uh, you know? on the roof? Yeah. Do, do you see the roofs becoming uh, almost like a cultural center because of these these activities? You know, not necessarily just the vertical farming, but, you know, you live in a, in a high rise or in a, you know, in a residential building, the roof is for everybody. So unless you're in Williamsburg where the developer has built, you know, the barbecue and the bars, you can see the sunset in the city. If you have a regular roof that be successful to everybody, do you see that as a possible phenomenon of community building and raising awareness and edu education? I mean, we, we definitely want to see stuff like that happening. And I think one of the nice things is this technology is evolving. It's becoming easier and easier for people to do small installations. People can reuse rooftop space. So certainly, it's it's possible now for communities to start building this kind of thing. Yeah, that is uh, that is interesting. Um, one of the things that I noticed in the very beginning when I moved to New York City, uh, one of the first uh, rooftop farms is uh, close to my house. I won't mention the name, but I was really happy to buy. Uh, well, you know, I, I was really, well, because I'm about to criticize, so there that, 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 that comes the question. My first uh, rooftop basil was crap, meaning that the smell was there, the color was there, the flavor was, uh, well, it was generous, so given that it was a live plant, I was excited, but the texture wasn't there. I could feel that, you know, that plant didn't get hit by real sun, didn't get re hit by real wind, didn't grow with the strength uh, is there an improvement? Is there, because, you know, they're not growing on soil. They're growing indoors. So all the climate, you, you, it's not just about the light. You need to recreate the whole microclimate around it. Yeah, that, that's a, exactly what we do at AeroFarms in terms of thinking holistically from the plants, the biology, the environment, the growing systems, uh, and then how we manage that entire process from seed to package. But we're looking very closely at those abiotic, uh, maybe environmental uh, factors. Uh, we're thinking about how we stress the plant. Uh, we have partnerships that we're doing with uh, Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research around our ability to identify stressors of leafy greens to mm -hmm. optimize for taste and nutrition. Uh, and we know, we, we develop what we call an algorithm in terms of what are those inputs. It's not just light, but it's the nutrients, uh, it's wind, it's CO2, it's all those variables going into how do we create uh, the right texture. I failed right in all these things 20 years ago when I had <laughs> the condom and in my room. It really takes a village though in terms of understanding um, you know, the entire process. And uh, something that Yara was saying before, it, it, they go together hand in hand. It's a symbiotic relationship. And so we realized early on that, you know, we're farmers at heart, but in order to be good at the farming, we need to be good at the technology. In order to be good at the technology, you need to be good at the farming. And I, I, I like the fact that the, in, in this moment, uh, part, at least, you know, as far as I consider us four on stage, it's kind of like, you know, the nerds of food. Like the, there is that kind of like a, I, d I don't want to call it overthinking, but definitely we're thinking more about the ingredients m more than many people that I know. And uh, that, that to me is really important, not just from the perspective of, uh, you know, having the right ingredient, but also, you know, saving the planet to a degree, you know, m making sure that the, 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 the footprint and the pollution, whatever we generate and create, whatever we decide to invest, uh, yields the results that are proportionate to the investment as opposed to, you know, generating a loss or being creating something that ends up in your fridge and, and gets tossed, you know, three days later. Um, Yara, uh, what about education in school? Do you see, do you see this as a, as a phenomenon that is being tackled? Uh, are uh, universities uh, creating uh, courses about this? Or this is like your own personal choice and you have to seek as you get out of college or as you get into the industry or as you become a, a restaurateur? just look for people like you because uh, there is not enough just yet. Oh man, no, I mean, schools are all about this kind of stuff. That's what we've seen at least. Our first client was actually a school, um, a special needs school based on the East Coast um, that wanted their own hydroponic farm so that they could train, um, you know, their students were um, vocational so that they could train them around farming and being able to sell the produce. Um, and that was the first thing that we did. And honestly, I think, you know, schools are developing this, these kinds of programs. They're mostly doing it within the science courses. 
and even more and more universities as well are kind of adding this arm. You find that a lot of universities today, like Cornell, they have these extension programs that really delve into this kind of work. Um, but program-wise, there are a few out there, and it definitely is increasing, for sure. Have you uh, have uh, anybody of you seen Big Pharma jumping on this already? Yeah, I mean, there's so much demand in terms of anything that's plant-based, in terms of understanding how to improve access sourcing. The same pain points you see on the food system is really on other verticals, whether it's you know pharmaceutical, cosmeceutical, nutraceutical, anything plant-based, and how to ad address those challenges you just talked about. So consistency, quality. One of the biggest challenges you see in that area, particularly is around toxic metals. So growing in the soil, there are a lot of issues in terms of, again, what the, the plants can absorb. So uh, well, I can see the difference in my Brooklyn backyard. Nothing that I put on the ground grows. I need to have real soil or compost. Like I've, I try to plant roses for my wife and I just, <laughs> they don't stick. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've commented on, you know, kind of real sun or real soil, but I think what we're trying to do is we, 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 we break it down in terms of really understanding what are the essential elements the plant needs, right? And so the macronutrients, micronutrients, and so plants don't need soil, right? They need to be able to understand the what agree, yeah. elements the they, they yeah. need within that. And so that's what's exciting that we can really reinterpret that and understand how to optimize the plants. and. It's only, you know, not only accentuating those flavors and textures, but it's accelerating the growth process Absolutely. too. So we're growing in a half or even a third of the time it may take out in the field. Without, you know, one, one of the things that I remember when my, my grandfather didn't start shutting down the farms, but we got to that point where generationally the sons and the daughters of the farmers wanted to go to the city. They wanted to study. They wanted to live behind that life, which... Uh, in the 70s felt uh, what was necessary for, for any industry, for any young adult that wanted to move forward in life. Then 20 years later, we all realized the incredible asset that land is, uh, and we want to bring back this kind of, uh, this kind of culture. At, at the same time, uh, I wish I was uh, a little younger, a little stronger, so I could do that. Uh, my question would be, when uh, uh, the food comes from, from a farm that is uh, a farm, like a, a traditional farm, uh, they can get certain kind of certification, organic, pesticides free and stuff. What are the rules that this new way of indoor farming or the issues they might, that, that you might have uh, into being certified or being considered organic or being considered completely natural? Because ultimately, for some of the people that I know, the industrial approach or the technical approach might be off-putting at times. Yeah, this is a huge question you've just asked. Um, and I think that we're starting to realize that maybe the organic label as a whole is maybe not appropriate to every kind of farming. And the organic label, I think, you know, if you think of yourself as, an, as a consumer, for some people that means pesticide free. Although if you look into the organic standard, it doesn't really mean completely pesticide free. Um, and if for some people it means, oh, a farmer is regenerating soil or they're doing, you know, nice farming practices. And for some people it has historically meant, oh, it's a f smaller farm and it's a, not an industrial thing. But all of those things now you can find, you know, examples th of farms that have organic certifications that, that go against that. And I think that as consumers and as producers, it's pretty clear that over the next five, ten years, we need to have a different set of labeling standards probably to really communicate what we're doing. Because you might have, say, a local farm that isn't organic, but you may choose to buy locally because you're not shipping it in. You maybe have a farm that is organic, but their labor practices are pretty horrific, and you know they're shipping from thousands of miles away. You may have a farm that's you know completely high tech and aeroponic or hydroponic that maybe doesn't you know have an organic label on it, but it has cleaner food and actually maybe better food for you that's safer, mm -hmm. um, it's more traceable. Uh, so I think all those issues are going to start to come to the fore. So we, we probably just need better labeling standards, I think, uh, over the next few years to uh, are to, there to any, show any that. Bodies right now that are looking at this, uh, or is uh, a little bit of a spread out issue where you need, you know, the, the, the government on one side, the research and the universities on the other side, or yeah. there is a common movement to making sure that that happens in a, in, in a speedy manner? Yeah, a couple things. One is first address the broad question in terms of what are the certifications. There, there isn't a certification that this new high tech farming, urban farming can't achieve that is also being achievable in the field. So, just in terms of setting that as a, a baseline or a benchmark. But there is the opportunity, as Rob is saying, that we can really set a new standard. And so that is a much more complex. And there are a number of different initiatives. Uh, one of the trade associations for the Association for Vertical Farming is helping look at this issue. Uh, it takes about five to seven years, though, in terms of thinking about how to get, how to normalize, what are the standards. Um, 
and then be able to think about all the different ways of growing, what are the key factors there. So these are complex. Uh, we're working with the government, though, in terms of certifications around what we call good agriculture practices, mm -hmm. good manufacturing practices. Uh, we just hosted uh, a food safety coalition uh, this past week at the United Fresh Council. It was one of the major produce uh, associations. And thinking about for controlled uh, environment uh, agriculture, this way of how can we set some new standards there that can help, again, really help the industry overall, make sure that there's awareness of what's needed in terms of testing and calibration. Because we're bridging now this idea of not only growing, but manufacturing. We're producing, we're, we're packaging all under one roof and really setting a new standard. There is, uh, there is something that is interesting that, that uh, applies uh, to kale. When I, I, I grew up in Tuscany, kale is about three feet tall, okay? But when I moved to California, all the yoga ladies decided to do shakes with baby kale, and all of a sudden baby kale became what, what is now. Um, but in Italy, especially in Tuscany, there is this way of saying that you do not harvest kale until it got the first freeze, because the first freeze of the year hits the texture of the leaf, alters it to a degree. It might be just mythology. But what about the argument that your climate is so controlled uh, that sometimes, uh, I, I do believe in the poetry of the weather. I do understand that if you're a farmer and you get a hailstorm, uh, six months of work or a whole year, of, a year of, of work can go down the drain. So on one side, you protect yourself from that because you do have you have a cycle, so you don't interrupt it and everything is controlled. On the other, what about the effect that real weather, that the real environment has uh, on, on plants? Who wants it? Uh, Yara, you want to start? I, I mean, I, I love this yeah, topic. I, I think the, the very basic thing to say is if we can control all these elements, then we can control things that actually improve flavor as well. And, you know, if you look back maybe 20, 30 years ago, the people experimenting with hydroponics we're kind of just trying to make plants grow. And, yep. they, and actually, you know, there's a pretty simple nutrient formula to just make plants grow. But now we've gone beyond that. And all of us are going, okay, what are the other things that make plants tasty? And you've talked about some of them. It might be uh, temperature, frost. It might be wind. It might be insects. You know, it might be other things in the soil like um, fungi mm -hmm. and beneficial bacteria, enzymes, those kinds of things. So, you know, all of us on the culinary side and people growing cannabis as well are starting to go like, okay, it's not just as simple as giving them these 11 nutrients. It's, okay, how do we create an environment that's going to maximize flavor? And, and part of that's the environment that's also about seed selection, as Mark was saying, you know, Absolutely. picking varieties that mm -hmm. don't necessarily have to be hardy, but they have to taste great. Is that and a work, sorry to interrupt, but is that a work that you guys are doing, selecting the seeds and, and isolating or, or breeding plants or you just for the moment just sourcing and growing what well, uh, I'll, I'll let you speak but you know we we generally select seeds we don't do any sort of modification we don't do any breeding in-house okay. or, or seed collecting that's from our side but uh, other people might be doing different okay things. yeah I mean we, we look at uh, both the genetics of the seed and thinking about characteristics uh, and thinking about there are certain seeds that have been developed now uh, and optimized for either growing hydroponically or growing indoor or growing for baby and taking those traits but fundamentally, what we're able to do with environmental controls is take any seed and change the characteristics by stressing it in different ways. So we can change the taste, the texture, the color, even the shape and the morphology just by you know, creating those stresses. So uh, that's what's exciting in terms of our ability to think about uh, long term, like how do we ensure supply and then how do we create some excitement within this category? That's yeah. a good question. Yara, how do you create the excitement? Well, you know, actually, I was I was also really excited about the previous jump, question. jump on, it. Yes. <laughs> but um, you know, kind of to you know bring together what everyone here is saying, it's important to keep in mind that this type of farming also opens up like a whole the bunch world. of opportunities, right? An example of that, just off the top of my head, is like being able to produce in a clean enough environment for a hospital yeah. environment, for example. Um, I know for me personally, I always was so excited just at the idea that. Um, a place that can't have a farm can now have one. Yeah. You know, just like that, obviously that's a simplistic way of thinking oh, about no, it, but that concept not. is it's really it's exciting. Massive. I mean, you know, right. people that haven't been in touch with the farm life and don't miss it as much yeah. as I do might be like, oh yeah, it's cool the idea of bringing a little piece of farm. To me, that yeah. I am a total like analog farmer at heart, but I live in the me metropoly like New York, the yeah. this idea to me is like, Revolutionary. Right. It, it will, you know, it truly can change the world. This is actually, you know, we have about six minutes left. I really would like to run the same question to you. The 
the future, the hope, and the challenges of what's happening now. And I really would like to hint a touch about the education. How do we make sure that people do realize uh, not just the commerce aspect of it, because obviously we, we are in this because we have already the end user. You have the chefs, we have the markets. But how do we make sure that mothers and fathers realize that it could be a good, uh, something good to do at home with the kids or you know, in the building or the community garden, wh whatever it is? I'm going to answer that by getting us to taste some of the things that I brought today. Yes. Because I think that you know, whenever we interact with kids about this topic, it's about getting them excited about yes. something. Yes. And it might be about taste. It might be just seeing a seed grow into a plant. It might be the tech, you know, the, the science behind it. Um, but I think if you want to try something I've brought here, so just if you're listening at home and yeah, not go watching, I'm going to okay. describe what I'm going to okay. give these guys. We grow something called purple oxalis. And this is a beautiful purple leaf that looks a little bit like a butterfly, and it comes on a straight stem. And I'm going to give this to these guys to taste. Oh, gosh. I love receiving flowers like yeah, this. So, All right, so you talk and we eat. And we chew on the Yeah, grass. and okay, then give me your it. reactions as you eat, by the way. So um, imagine. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you tasting? Oh, <laughs> this is, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> this reminds me, oh, gosh, it's a jump back, like, Four years. Um, we have this uh, grass that grows up uh, in, in my mom's garden. It's called trifoglio. It's like a, it's like a three-leaf clover. Yeah. And what I used to do with my kid, uh, with my brothers, rip it and suck on the stems when we were kids. We would go look for them on a bicycle yeah. and never made it into the salad. Like I always ask mom, why don't you make it in the salad? This is like lemon. It's like, because the dogs piss on it. I'm like, what? <laughs> put it in a vase. <laughs> well, I can, I can pretty much guarantee no dog has been near, near this. What you're probably describing, we would call that wood sorrel mm -hmm. uh, that we you also get in North America, which would be a oh, green one. But this is mm. a purple one. So you can see why people get excited about that. It looks mm. cool. It tastes, it has the sour, like green apple kind of tang to it. And I think that's one of the things that if you want to get kids excited, it's like, right. wow, this stuff can really taste amazing. Um, I'd love you guys to taste one more thing if we have time. Yeah, 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 yeah go yeah. for it. So we have these fennel crowns as okay. well. So everyone at home, like, um, you know the fennel, you can actually rip off just some little ones yeah. there for you guys. Um, you have a fennel bulb that you'll normally buy from the supermarket, which tastes great, but the plant also produces flowers, um, and normally towards the end of the year, so the autumn time. And the flowers have the beautiful anise flavor, right? Uh, but also some sweetness to it as well. And so I think, you know, again, going back to excitement and how to, you know, get people interested in this technology, it's about showing people, wow, you know, plants, flowers, herbs, they've got so much flavor in them. It's not like we really need to manufacture a new product, you know. Agreed. It, there's, right. there's flavor in nature that we just need to capture. And, and we can do that in the middle of the city. It could be January. Uh, it could be snowing outside, and now with this technology, we can all grow. You can taste things. the summertime. Yeah, exactly. In January. Yeah, I was just going to add at Aero Farms. I mean, our high bar is that no salad dressing is needed. You're enjoying it for what it is, and actually, our experience with schools and our systems that we've had uh, in the inner city schools, uh, Chervil actually was the sort of um, the the Trojan horse, if you will, mm -hmm. entry in because of again that that licorice f taste and oh. was enjoyed, and they called it the green candy. All of a sudden. You're reinterpreting, you know, something that's familiar, and then having it be healthy and nutritious. And that connection that they have with their food, you're talking about how it extends into the broader community. It's been really exciting to see how it extends into their extended family. And there, we, there's changes that they make in terms of lifestyle habits. Some have gone you know, completely vegan. So it's been incredibly energizing, empowering to interact with the students and see the, you know, that feedback. I, I absolutely love your point of using these flavors to season your food as opposed to over salted pepper, spices, sauce it. The sauce is one of the things that I didn't grow up with, you know, the whole using sauce as a condiment is to me more of an American kind of mm -hmm. concept. In Italy, we use a little lemon or a little balsamic, but even balsamic, when I grew up, balsamic vinegar was not a thing. The, our vinegar was the old bottle of wine that just mm. went yeah. sour, and that's, <laughs> how, you know, that, that, that's what we used. Um, but let's try to, uh, I, I want to finish on, uh, on Our Lady, on Yara. Yeah. Your, 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 your dream for the future. What do you see that, that the biggest challenges, that the walls that have to fall, and what yeah. do you hope for this industry to give us? And yeah, I mean, I would hope a lot of things. That's also a big question. But in regards to, you know, education-wise, I would hope that there would be kind of just more access for schools to just look at this kind of farm, be introduced to this kind of environment, taste this kind of produce. Um, I think for urban environments and cities, 
to make this technology cheaper, which it's kind of you know moving in that direction anyway, make it even more accessible. Um, and so that kind of when you're walking around in a place like New York City, you're able to see more greenery. I, if anybody, would, you know, if, if anybody, <laughs> for the people that are listening, <laughs> if anybody's listening <laughs> or watching, um, what would you say is uh, the first uh, th the first good project to do at home where you, you, you kind of mm -hmm. like can get a few results? Uh, well, we have actually a website um, called plus.farm. OK. And so it's basically um, this platform that you know, kind of gives you the information on how you can build your own farm and all the stuff is from like Home Depot and Amazon. Fantastic. Um, so that's like a good place to start, I think, for... Uh, yeah, good for the it. summer for, you yeah. know, fathers to keep their kids <laughs> yeah. and mothers to keep their kids <laughs> occupied. Uh, guys, I want to thank you so, so much. I uh, wish you the thank best you. of luck in all your endeavors and uh, I, I really hope that this movement keeps growing because I, I do see the necessity, not just of the, you know, making sure that we have good ingredients available, uh, but... Uh, a good way also for us to be connected to the world that we live in and be more aware of the things that we eat and just uh, I do believe that this is also an act of respect towards the, the, the world that we live in is a way of uh, helping the growing population, yeah. helping uh, our health, making sure that we have uh, uh, what we need that is, uh, that is available and to and these flavors were like this final fennel <laughs> it's like kissing my great grandmother with her <laughs> anise candies, but <laughs> I, 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 I have my I great grandmother's that. bread now. <laughs> well, no, it was weird because that those were the candies that she always These had. Long term memories, and uh, uh, that is uh, we've uncovered some things. Well, but, <laughs> uh, no, but 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 you see, but you see, this is uh, and and I said goodbye, and, and the but this is exactly this is where the connection happens. Oh, like you right. know, the, I, I I I do not get this this smack in the face when I open a box of salad from the store. Like those flavors do do not exist in the stores that we go to. And I do understand the convenience because we live in a world where time is limited and, and, right. and budgets are always, and the kids and the, the two jobs. And uh, these are things that we should not miss out on. So I wish you all the best uh, and uh, I change the world for us. Make the world a better place. Thank, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. From stage 17, Future Bites to say goodbye, and uh, I'll see you next time, next episode. Be well. Ciao.